The names of the Mongols, Huns, and Scythians immediately come to mind when discussing nomadic peoples of the Great Eurasian Steppe. But the Kuman Kipchak people belong among them as one of the most influential of these societies. In this video, we will discuss their origin, history, and society, and their so called confederation, which dominated the steppes on the eve of the Mongol expansion and was among their greatest rivals. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you! The Kuman Kipchaks were a nomadic people who dominated the Eurasian steppes from Ukraine to Kazakhstan from the 11th century until the Mongol conquest in the 13th century. Predominantly speakers of Turkic languages, historical sources use a variety of terminology to refer to them. Broadly speaking, Kuman predominates in European and Byzantine sources, Polovsky in Rus accounts, Kipchak in Islamic sources, and both Kipchak and Kang Li in Chinese and Mongol sources. European accounts called their territory Kamania, with Islamic sources using Dashti Kipchak. The sources sometimes use these terms interchangeably, while others indicate these were distinct groups within this shared milieu. Thus, the inhabitants on the far west were largely people identified as Kumans, while east of the Caspian Sea, the Kang Li were the dominant faction and in between, Kipchak lived across the steppe. Altogether, they tend to be called the Kuman Kipchak Confederation. Like most steppe peoples, the origins of the Kuman Kipchaks are hotly debated, with numerous contradictory theories put forth. We will try to keep to the most broadly agreed upon facts. A common yet controversial theory associates the first mention of the Kipchak with a group called the Sir in the 8th century Orkhon inscriptions in Mongolia of the second Turkic Khaganate. Other Turkic and Uyghur monuments of the following centuries may bear the Kipchak name on them, but these readings are disputed due to the conditions of the inscriptions. Efforts to identify them with groups mentioned in Chinese sources are likewise contentious. Only in the 9th century are their whereabouts better defined, as Islamic geographers clearly identify the Kipchak within a poorly understood polity known as the Kikmek Union in eastern Kazakhstan. Over the next centuries, we can track their steady movement westwards, displacing existing Turkic peoples like the Oghuz, helping encourage the movement of the ancestors of the Seljuks into Islamic lands. Then, in the 11th century, a series of large-scale Western migrations rocked Asia, likely set off by the Khitan-ruled Liao dynasty in North China and Mongolia trying to tighten its power over the peoples of Manchuria and the Mongolian Plateau. Broadly, these migrations are referred to in Islamic sources as the Kun migrations, named for one of the primary groups within this movement. The Kun moved quickly across the steppes. The migration began around 1018, and by the 1050s they were in the Pontic steppes, suddenly appearing in Rus' and Byzantine sources, and crushing the Pecheneg nomads. While some sources at the time referred to them as Kun, as Hungarian still does, we also see them adopt the Turkic suffix man on their name. These Kun men, or Kumen, became their most common designation in European sources, Kuman. From the 11th century onwards, the Kumans, ruling over the western part of the Kipchak, were the dominant nomadic peoples of the Eurasian steppes. Though modern writing calls them a confederation, this was rather a sea of independent Turkic princes from the Carpathians to the Irtysh River, who, at least to outsiders, could be broadly grouped together as Kumans in the steppes of modern Ukraine, Kipchaks between the Don River and Caspian Sea, and a third group east of the Ural River and in modern Kazakhstan, 
where we see references to both Kipchak and Kang Li. In the early 12th century, this group became dominated by the Ulbeli, who appear to have fled the Jurchen Jin dynasty's conquest of the Khitan, who had in turn fled west to establish the Empire of Karakitai in the 1130s. Whether any of them recognized themselves as any sort of shared Kuman Kipchak identity, we cannot say, as all accounts come from outsiders and little is known of their internal matters. Interestingly, most names associated with the western part of this group relate to paleness or the color yellow. The root of Kumen, Ku, likely comes from the old Turkic word meaning pale, flaxen yellow. It seems, broadly speaking, that most names for the Kumans in the West are direct translations of the same term. This has led some to suggest it was a reference to the yellow grasslands of the steppes, others a reference to the pale-colored horses of the Kumans. Some have even suggested that this was a reference to Kumans being predominantly blonde-haired. The Kuman Kipchaks were the elites within the steppe, ruling over existing Turkic nomads and others. Lands and peoples were assigned to the Kuman Kipchak aristocracy to rule over. Much of their wealth was in their animals, herds of sheep, goats, cattle and horses in great number. Pastures for winter and summer were designated, and the various members of society moved between them seasonally. Like most Eurasian steppe nomads, they lived their life on horseback and practiced archery daily. As highly skilled and mobile horse archers, they were fearsome raiders, all valuable mercenaries across Eurasia. In terms of religion, there is a general assumption of Turkic animism and worship of Tengri. Canines were venerated among them, as many Kuman and Kipchak names relating to dogs and wolves are known and several sources attest to their habit of cutting a dog in half to mark important occasions, alliances and weddings. Aristocrats were entombed in large burial mounds known as kurgans, which show indications of animal sacrifice, including dogs and horses. There are also indications of Christianity among them. The Central Asian Muslim geographer Al-Mawazi in the early 12th century describes them as Eastern Christians, or so-called Nestorians. In Ruslands, some converted to Orthodox Christianity, especially when marrying into them, or to Catholicism by the Kumans in the Hungarian Kingdom, or they were converted by Franciscan missionaries. Meanwhile, those in Islamic states were often staunch converts to Islam. Major divisions between the various Kuman Kipchak unions were marked by the great steppe rivers like the Don, Volga, Ural and Mor. While at times certain princes among them rose up to develop a greater following, there does not seem to have been any sort of political framework that stretched across the entirety of their lands. All Kuman Kipchak princes were largely independent lords. Even their titulature is unknown. While it is common to call their leaders Khans, there is no clear indication any held it as a title. Contemporary sources always translate their titles to the equivalent of king, duke, prince and so forth, whereas Khan is regularly untranslated or given an equivalent term meaning emperor. The Kuman Kipchak were well known as ferocious warriors, preeminent ranged and skirmishing troops. Their horsemen raided Central Asia, the Caucasus, Central and Southeastern Europe and the Rus principalities, as well as each other. This internal warfare made the steppes particularly dangerous to travel during that time. Often they fought as mercenaries. Rus princes often sought to get as much military assistance from the Kumans as possible. In the 12th and 13th centuries, Kuman troops were regular auxiliaries of the Bohemians and Hungarians against Germans and Austrians. The Byzantine Empire first made allies of the Kumans to destroy the Pechenegs, but by the late 12th century, Kuman troops helped the Bulgarians and Vlachs push out the Byzantines to establish the Second Bulgarian Empire in the 1180s. In Georgia, a major community of Kipchaks settled there and became valued allies of the Georgian kings. Across the former lands of the great Seljuks, Kipchaks could be found in great numbers on both sides of a conflict. These contracts were often sealed with marriage alliances. In Rus, Hungary and Georgia, a number of royals took Kuman Kipchak princesses as wives, who were baptized and took Christian names. Usually their pre-baptismal name is unknown. In the Khwarezmian Empire, Kipchaks were not just most of the armed troops of the Shah, 
but their own elite, as the Khwarezmian leadership married into them over generations. They served in the regional trade. Their horses were prized as hardy animals for war, and they exported the rest of their livestock too. They were conduits for trade, transferring goods from Volga Bulgaria and Siberia, such as furs, honey and slaves, to the wider world via the Crimean Peninsula, where many Cumans settled as permanent traders. Some picked up agriculture, even just seasonally. The early 14th century Codex Comanicus, a dictionary and linguistic manual for traders to learn the Cuman language, features many agricultural terms. A few towns associated with them are noted in the sources. A city called Saxin, for example, was a major trade hub along the lower Volga River, but little is known of it. Burial mounds show that the elite enjoyed access to many imported wares. The Chungol Barrow site in southern Ukraine likely marks a Kuman lord buried with armor, weapons and imported goods, with Byzantine amphorae and silk kaftan, drug jars from Syria, and a cup from the Rhineland, golden chains and a torque. A brief mention can also be made of the famous moustached masks associated with them. This was an association made by Soviet archaeologists in the early 20th century, but is now doubted as the provenance of surviving examples is uncertain or came from graves which are more likely to date to the Mongol period, as the masks are usually found in association with a style of helmet developed in the 14th century that likely came with the Mongols west, while there are some surviving paintings that seem to indicate Mongol usage of these masks. Games like Kingdom Come Deliverance have popularized the Kuman Association, but there is no current evidence to support it being a distinguishing feature of their equipment. The Kuman Kipchak world was completely transformed with the arrival of the Mongols. First contact came when some of Chinggis Khan's enemies, fleeing his unification of Mongolia, sought shelter with the eastern Kangli and Kipchak around the Aral Sea. In 1218, Chinggis Khan's oldest son Jochi and the young general Subaday pursued and fought a series of battles in western Kazakhstan. The Mongols were victorious, but were attacked by the Khwarezm Shah Muhammad II during their retreat, Muhammad's army being composed of many Kipchaks as well. When the great Mongol invasion of Khwarezm was launched in 1219, the Mongols regularly fought the Kipchak troops of the Shah, many of whom defected to the Mongols. After the initial invasion, Jochi was sent into the steppes around the Aral Sea to subjugate the Kipchaks there, while the generals Jebe and Subade passed through the Caucasus Mountains and fought Kipchaks and Kumans in the western steppes at the famous Kalka River battle, and sacked the Kipchak settlement of Saxin. Many Kipchak were captured and brought east to fight against the Jin dynasty. In turn, some even defected to join the Jin against the Mongols. Between 1223 and 1235, there was sporadic combat as the Mongol Empire steadily expanded to the Ural River. The Mongols saw it as an important front. Chinese accounts from the period indicate that Chinggis Khan and the Mongol leadership saw the Kipchak as their most dangerous foes. As fellow nomads, they had fearsome potential if they united against the Mongols. This brought extra impetus in the early 1230s when a Kipchak named Bakman in the Volga steppes began to organize resistance. By 1236, the great invasion led by Subade and Jochi's son Batu was underway, cutting this Kipchak resistance and Bakman in half. Other Kumans, notably under the leader Koten, fled before the Mongols to shelter in Hungary, where Mongol armies pursued them. By the mid-1240s, after putting down several revolts, the Mongols had subjugated the Kuman Kipchaks. The Deshti Kipchak was then reorganized, their pastures and peoples redistributed among the Mongols and sent around their empire as servants and soldiers for their armies, and many sold overseas into slavery. Many were sent east to fight for the Mongols, with the future great Khan Kublai using them against the Dali Kingdom in Yunnan and against the Song Dynasty. This unit grew in time, and by the late 13th century, was known as the Kipchak Guard, one of the Great Khan's most important and influential units. While their lands fell under Mongol dominion, those who were displaced outside of their former homeland showed a remarkable ability to adapt to their new environments. In the 12th century, Kuman Kipchaks became a favored source of Gulams or Mamluks, 
professional slave soldiers for Islamic states. Sold abroad as young children, they were converted to Islam, professionally trained, and provided the finest equipment. They were famed for their combat prowess and loyalty to their new masters, often considered more loyal than the monarch's own sons. The Ghurid Sultanate, which conquered them from eastern Iran through North India, relied extensively upon them, and after the death of the last Ghurid Sultan in 1206, his Kipchak Gulams promptly divided his empire between themselves. One of these became the Delhi Sultanate, which dominated northern India for the next three centuries. For its first decades, most of the Delhi Sultanate's leadership and elite were Kipchaks. Delhi's most famous female sultan, Razia Sultana, was a Kipchak princess born in India. The most famous Kipchak Mamluk dynasty was in Egypt. The final Ayyubid rulers purchased many Kipchaks as Mamluks, who then seized power in the 1250s. Many, including their famed Sultan Baybars, had been displaced by the Mongols as youths, and in a twist of fate, were responsible for the most famous Mongolian defeat at Ain Jalut in 1260. The Mamluks of Egypt continued to purchase more Kipchaks from the steppes, resisting the Mongol Ilkhanate for decades and capturing the final Crusader holdouts in the region. In southeastern Europe, a dynasty of likely Kuman origin, the Teteroba, took power in Bulgaria in the 1280s, backed by the powerful Mongol prince Nogai. Other regional lords intermarried with or had Kuman ancestors, possibly including the infamous Vlad Dracul. In Hungary, King Bela IV invited the Kumans back after the Mongol invasion, giving them extensive land in the middle of his kingdom and forming an important part of the Hungarian army against Mongols and other Europeans. He married his heir, Isfan, to a Kuman princess, and when their son, Laszlo, took the throne, he was infatuated with his mother's culture. He was derisively remembered as Laszlo the Kuman. To this day, the lands given to the Kumans in Hungary are known as Lesser and Great Khomeinia. On the other end of the continent, in Mongol ruled China, the Kipchak Guard grew in might, and its commander became one of the most powerful men in the Khanate. Under its commander, an Ulberli Kipchak named El Timo, the Great Khan was his puppet until his death in 1335, upon which his family was purged. In the Golden Horde, the Mongol Khanate ruling the former Kuman Kipchak lands, the small Mongolian population was gradually absorbed amongst its Turkic subjects. By the 14th century, use of the Mongolian language was reduced to among the royal family, ceremonial duties, select government institutions, and for diplomacy with the other Mongol Khanates. Though it is common today to refer to the Golden Horde as the Kipchak Khanate, there is no indication this term was ever in use by the Horde itself. Given that it viewed the Kipchaks as its subjects, it seems doubtful they would have identified themselves by them in favour of its Chinggisid identity. Rather, the Kumans and Kipchaks in Horde lands began to identify themselves as Tatars. The Codex Comanicus, for example, already in the early 14th century used Tatar to refer to the Kuman language. In this manner, the Kipchak continued on and became the ancestors of many Turkic peoples across Eurasia, especially Tatars, Kyrgyz and Kazakhs, whose languages are identified in the Kipchak branch of the Turkic language family. Our series on various nomadic cultures will continue in the near future, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.